Hi there, this is Bianca Lopez and this is Be In The Know. This Be In The Know is a special version backstage, sort of an insider view into my trip into India and me talking about some of the research that I did before getting here. This is my first time going to Bangalore, actually India in general, and it's been quite fascinating. It's incredible to find everybody speaking English for the most part, and I know that sounds like a silly thing to say, but Hangzhou is not the case. Uh, so communicating has turned out to being a little bit easier. The food is incredible and its diversity in terms of the different parts of India and the different influences and what makes the spices, it's really interesting for me. Um, a little spicy at times, but I'm learning. And most importantly, it's been incredible to watch what a thriving digital economy India truly is. From watching everything to talking to people about one of my favorite things, which is the reason for this post, identity. This is the follow up from the Dubai and I'm gonna endeavor to try to do this every time I go to a different city. So let's talk about the world's largest biometric infrastructure. My routes and beginnings and identity were biometric and India has not a shy number of 1.2 billion fingerprints and irises registered in what's called the Adar. And the thing that this program has given lots of people to talk about, but the two ones that I want to focus on are ones near and dear to my heart. One actually happened in September of last year. So in September of last year, uh, the Adar government said that the registration was only mandatory now for government services. So if you actually have to access welfare um, or specific government programs, you actually have to register for the Adar. It's not no longer mandatory, even though it's constitutional. So there's a little fine line there. And all of this happened because of a bunch of fuss that people put up with um, in terms of, and I don't mean fuss in the bad way, but a lot of activists said that this was infringing on basic people's legal rights to privacy. Which then leads me to the second fact that happened last year, just a month earlier from them declaring this, this was no longer mandatory to open bank accounts. They declared this because of the first stab that India took at a privacy law bill. And this was about data enforcement. So a little bit of a stab at something what looks like a GDPR for those of you who know um, that has been implemented in the UK. Uh, and Europe is kind of slowly and surely upticking it. Most people don't know what it is. It's like provocative like a song but it's to do with privacy and who has the right to have what when and how and this is mostly due to data leaks and stories coming out about how people could easily by paying a sum of money get into the government program and have access to people's biometrics and I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this but by talking to people and reading both of those latest developments last year lead me to believe there might be a transformation in an optic kind of a restart button in the Adar system, which for a biometric identity geek is quite the interesting thing. Imagine a country as big as India having registered 1.2 billion people and still having about 1.1 billion that are not registered. This is all part and supported by the UN in this whole plan that by 2030, everybody should have an identity in the world. So what does this mean? How do they go about upholding or restarting? It's interesting because as I walked into the country, I was mandated to give my fingerprints, which was kind of like commonplace coming from China. Um, and I couldn't help to notice that actually the fingerprint device used is from a company called Suprema, a public traded company, which I've had the pleasure to work with before in my previous life. And they're based in Korea. And when I started looking into it, the actual templates that are stored for tourists are not the same as uh, the ones that are done in the Adar system. So there we go, a start to an interoperability problem if you're really doing this for security, being the government. A lot of you will remember some of the news around 2017 when it talked about when the Adar program went from giving somebody a proof of their existence to actually enabling opening bank accounts. There was about 290 five million bank accounts opened um, in one of the facts that I found. And that's actually, they count as representing about 90% of the Indian household. So that meant that at least one around one household had a bank account. The interesting thing with this whole conversation about banked unbanked is that when you look at about 19% of the population of India still lives in remote villages. And actually, when you look double click on the number of bank accounts, their usage is actually quite low, which then derives to a question about, yes, identities undoubtedly 
an enabler for allowing people to exist is what I usually call an infrastructure layer to build anything. If you don't have identity, how can you build services? How can you build trust? How can you provide me proper services or value? But it's interesting that 80% of all the transactions in India are still carried out by cash. So my question becomes, if the government rolls out a service like this, how much can you say that identity allowed you to change people from banked to unbanked, uh, unbanked to banked, but how much illiteracy do they have if they're still using cash? And what is the reason behind it? So let's talk about not unbanked and banked, but the scope creep that happened with the ADAR implementation for identity. So kind of tied to my theme or my questioning to you in my last post about China, there was started to become a growing sort of concern of what is the role of the government and what are they doing with my biometrics and can the state misuse it and without the number of articles and things you might have read about corruption there's a newspaper that went as far as saying that they had paid the government a small sum of money to actually get access to ADAR information which is a scary thought and that scary thought leads me to question something I always do who is the right to your data who is the right to your biometric? Is the government there to protect you or are they have the right to be surveillant all the time? So with that concern, I looked into why is never privacy or data considered when implementing these identity things? It's almost like an identity infrastructure in this conversation doesn't need to happen when I think it's so foundational to building anything. I don't care about um, the next legislation that comes around, if you don't have an identity infrastructure and privacy built in by design, you won't be able to get anywhere. So why is it? So I dug and talked to a few people. And actually something that's pretty common in most countries is that most privacy data protection laws date back to the early 2000s. Some of them in the States are in the 19 something. So India's is the international, um, Technology Act, which dates back to 2000. And when reading the fine print and trying to get the summary note, it kind of talks about just penalizing people for hacking or unethical things like raw, like um, robbing and impersonating somebody online. There is nothing that deals with the complexities and the issues that we live in today's digital society and world. There was nothing that was conceived and talked about in terms of biometrics or encryption or any of that stuff, let alone blockchain, which I won't get into. So that leads me to believe, which is why in uh, August of last year, in 2018, they passed the law, the first sort of bill of looking at Data Protectionist Act. When you double click on that one, it actually leads to a bit of a data war, which is some of the news that you might have heard. There was actually an issue in The Economist talking about data tariffs and data wars, which was quite interesting. And India does not want to be left behind. So in some of the wording of India, it actually explains a few other things. It talks about the fact that data that belongs to Indians or it's anything to do with private confidential information, PII for those of you in the States that talk about that a lot, um, is, has to have at least one server in India. The act hasn't been actually full-fledged into effect. But if you know a thing or two about WhatsApp and WhatsApp launching payment platform, you will know that there's a reason why there might be some rumors of WhatsApp setting up shop in a legal entity in India, because otherwise it would not be able to service its, 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 um, its users anymore, its clients. And I was thinking about what, <laughs> what kind of service they would have, because I had another interesting conversation regarding WhatsApp, and apparently there's a lot of election swaying happening in WhatsApp groups. I won't get into why, um, the reason why politically data privacy wasn't part of the Adar government. That is way above my, my level of understanding in terms of how it is a massive democracy get all the stakeholders involved but it's another point to remind you how multi-stakeholder issue is identity at its core level it's not about just a cool shiny authentication platform it actually has sort of a ripple effect that it's scary when you step back and think of it globally and even in a micro level there's a few big players here 
So Paytm has actually invested over $786 million last year in growing its payments infrastructure. I have to confess I haven't seen much of it being used other than for the younger population and a bit of the more fortunate ones because I've been walking around every corner of Bangalore. Apparently New Delhi and Mumbai is quite prominent way of paying. Another one that's actually leading the way is a company called Phone Fee. Phone Fee is an arm of a retailer um, called Flipchart and they've invested $500 million in the past few years just on growing the payments infrastructure. What's up? Actually, a funny story uh, where Brazil and India intersect. For those of you who remember Orkut, Orkut has its two largest, um, and for those of you who don't know, is, uh, came before Facebook, and I used to have it, and I don't have Facebook if you were wondering. Um, and they have the largest Brazil and um, India populations. We jumped right on and I guess we're social. And the same goes for WhatsApp. Uh, and they have about 200 million uh, users actively in India and they're rolling out their payment scheme apparently sometime soon. So stay tuned because I think they might be setting up a local entity to sort of separate the conversation on privacy between WhatsApp and Facebook. Google, Apple and others are following pretty quickly. I'm not sure what is it to expect from them and none of them wanted to talk to me here. So if you know anybody or know anything, let me know. Well, I sit here and unfortunately say goodbye to India by tomorrow. I wonder and question how does data and privacy will shape up this reform or redo of Adar? And it's quite of a basic question between a foundational or a functional identity. And what is the role of the government or anybody managing those two? Interesting fact is that Adar actually stands for Hindu it's called foundation. So if the foundation of the state, could they rule in the Supreme Court that non-government identities, no matter how voluntary they might be from the user's part, are actually unconstitutional? What happens then? Or maybe if it can be worked out through backdoors that other stakeholders are going to be using the ADAR infrastructure system as the standard for interoperable identity in the country, how can it be effectively managed? How can the security of something that's owned by the government be managed by business applications and others alike? What would that look like? And what is data protection when it comes to that? What happens if you're a company that's servicing clients in India and you have to have your data here and you're using the government's infrastructure for identity because it's unconstitutional to do so? The question leads me to question even again, are we building an overstate of surveillance? And is that the right role of the government? And is, is that what transformational identity would look like? What would it take for it to be truly interoperable? Or what would it take for people to understand that does the government have the right to open my Facebook or look at any of my data at any given time? Where does the line get drawn on all of this? And what does it look like to uphold 1.2 billion people if the, the system were to change? I always question uh, biometric enrollment, not only on the liveness, which a lot of these systems fail to have, but actually on the fact that I age every day with the amount of planes and banks I talk to. I love you all, but I do. <laughs> and most biometric enrollments, for those of you who don't know, I'll leave you a tip that has nothing to do with India. They're actually linear. So from a mathematical perspective, they are a token. That it's like, I got to know you, I take a token of your face and I store that. And I keep matching it against the old one. It's like a yes or no binary answer. I don't need to tell you that human beings are not binary, let alone they're biometric. We age every day and there's complexity in the variables. So this uphold reform not only has technology issues and life cycle management to take into account, but it also has data and privacy concerns written all over it. So leave your questions and stay tuned for another Be In The Know. I'll see you in the next country I'm in and stay in the know. Bye.